Coming up next on Futures in Biotech, we discuss everything from symbiotic devices to human proteome phage to the race between transcription and translation, genetics gone wild. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, Episode 82, Bionic Brain Symbionts, the next phase of human slurry. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there the AD extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that will end up rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier. Uh, today is uh, June 24th, so uh, it's this, you know, pretty much uh, very early summer here, and it's the first episode of our sixth year of doing Futures in Biotech. Um, so to bring it down a notch in terms of lightness here, um, we're not interviewing a, we're not going into someone's lab. We're, we're I brought decided to bring a panel together, and we have uh, Dr. Justin Sanchez. Uh, and Andre Nantel and myself, we're going to talk about some scientific stories uh, that we think are really interesting this summer. So, hey, there's Justin. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing great. Glad to be on the panel. It's been a long time since I've done one of these. It's, I think it's been uh, almost two years since you've been on the show. And uh, for those um, who don't know Justin, he is a the director of the Neuroprosthetics Group Research Group, sorry, associate professor, Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Miami. And he's wow. got a lot of scientific posters there. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and we're trying to pull Andre onto the uh, onto the line, and um, he's having some video issues with a, a, a new uh, Skype upgrade. But we'll, we'll we'll get him on in a second. Um, so, uh, of the stories that we'd like to talk about today, um, I want to talk about some recent uh, work that has been done with cystic fibrosis. Um, an auto antigen um, te technology that allows us to determine uh, how to identify. So there's autoimmune diseases where your your body's antibodies can't re recognize between self and non-self, and they start attacking um, your, uh, your your cells and causing neurological disorders. For example, um, there's a new technique to identify what proteins the, your auto antibodies, your own immune system, is messing up and, it, and attacking. That hasn't been. It's been very very difficult to do up till now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a global quantification of mammalian gene expression control. Um, Andres can present that story, and we're going to uh, talk about uh, Justin's story. Um, a paper that Justin recently published um, in March, which is a uh, just just reading the title, a symbiotic brain machine interface through value based decision making. The idea of a, s a symbiotic brain machine just I thought was absolutely crazy and wild. And uh, so while we're trying to get Andre, um, why don't I, I talk about the cystic fibrosis story first and we'll, we'll break the ice with that. Is that okay? Um, are you there, Justin? I'm here. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, so, in the uh, in the news, right? The well, let's I'll take it a step back here. CF, cystic fibrosis, is a it's a disease where uh, patients develop thick mucus in their lungs, and they uh, this thick mucus leads to infection, and it leads to um, uh, like inflammatory response, and the lifespan. The median lifespan right now is 37 years, right? And there's about 70,000 people in the U.S. and Europe that have uh, the genetic disorder. 22 years ago, there was a paper published on the gene. So we, it became understood 
the molecular pathology of the disease 22 years ago, at least a, a large chunk of it. But yet, still today, there's been no therapeutics that have hit the market that have been effective at uh, curing the disease. The only thing patients can do is manage the symptoms, right? And this is the era of biotech where you can understand exactly what's going on, but yet there's been no, um, there's been no cure. So this has been a very, very tough challenge, and it just illustrates how difficult it is that even though you understand uh, a genetic disorder, how hard it is to fix it. But um, Vertex in Boston has managed to uh, get a, a compound past two phase three clinical trials. Um, let me explain a little bit, a bit about the context of, of their work, right? The Vertex, about 10 years ago, acquired Aurora, Bio, Aurora Biosciences for $592 million. And this gave them the, the technology to develop compounds that could modify uh, CFTR mo or create uh, CFTR modulators. Now, cystic fibrosis uh, is a disease where there is a mutation in uh, a protein called a cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. It's a chloride channel. It's a selective chloride channel that allows chloride to get across the epithelium. Epithelium is the lining. It's the, your skin. It's the, the lining of your lungs, the lining of your nasal passages. It's the basically the tissue that 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 is exposed to the outside or quote unquote the inside of your body. And and uh, it, it's very important to have a chloride. Uh, channel there to, to balance uh, ionic potential. Um, there are two kinds of mutations. One, the most common, is called the delta F508. So it's a phenylalanine deletion mutation. And the protein can't traffic to the cell surface. Okay, it's the protein, the, the RNA is translated to uh, protein uh, and to peptides, the peptides fold. But as they get traffic to the surface, they get returned and degraded. Um, that's the most common mutation. There's another mutation, a form of mutation, where you have a loss of function of the channel. The, it's made, it's trafficked, but there's a, a the um, it has an altered function, right? So you've got a, a chloride channel there, but if you if you could just get it to work, uh, you would you now have Im improved the outcome of the patient. So th th this first. The, this first molecule is called, um, uh, these are really hard to pronounce, um, Ivacafor? No, it's Ivacac, sorry, <laughs> let's take three, Ivacaftor, Ivacaftor, I don't know how they named it, but so it, it's a, um, a molecule that modulates the activity of that second form of mutation where the, the, the protein actually gets to the cell surface and um, but it, it, it doesn't work. So what this does is it, it can uh, improve uh, uh, the activity, the chloride activity. The only problem is that only affects 4% of the 70,000 patients, right? But it's the first time somebody's been able to get a modulator to have an improved outcome. Um, a little bit about uh, this mutation. It's the glycine 551 to aspartic acid mutation. Uh, it's a mutation in the nucleotide binding site. So these chloride channels bind ATP and then release ATP or ADP. And uh, people with this mutation, can't; their CFTR channel doesn't bind uh, ATP very well. So it has weak activity. So the, this drug, uh, Ivacaftor, uh, improves uh, channel uh, activity. And they did two clinical trials, two phase three clinical trials, 161 patients from, page, from ages 12 and up and 52 patients from six, uh, six to 11. And they tested them for forced expiratory volume, uh, expiratory volume in one second. So uh, FEV1, as they call it. They had an improved uh, lung function by 10.5%, right? And this can translate to an extension of five years. So um, I think this is a really uh, worthy story um, in that it demonstrates after 22 years of effort uh, an investment of $592 million on the part of Vertex. Um, Vert, uh, the CFF or the uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has put in uh, um, a considerable amount of resources as well and they, they recently put in $75 million into the Vertex effort and also 25 million to other groups um, to tackle this. Uh, and now there's proof of concept that a drug can get to 
past clinical trials and soon translate to uh, to the market and extend uh, CF patients. So this is a tremendous uh, story of, of, of molecular medicine and tackling a genetic disorder. Uh, Vertex's next step is they have some molecules. There's one called Lumacador. I can't pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> Lumacator. So that... Um, that uh, actually can for the for the large population that have the delta f508 mutation the one that doesn't traffic to the surface this can bind to the cftr channel and cause it to traffic so now you're going to have a comp they're going into a phase two combination clinical trial where the uh they add uh the the molecule that can potentiate the activity and one that can cause it to restore trafficking to improve potential uh outcome and the, and the goal is to really improve the activity by 50 percent which would probably be the threshold you need to restore full chloride channel activity or a functional uh, chloride channel to a point where there would be no deficit in lifespan. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's, I think this is a, a tremendous story and uh, worth following up on. As a small biotech company myself, uh, here in, in Cleveland, we've uh, you know, put in about three and a half million to develop uh, some molecules for brain swelling. And I'm wondering if it took Vertex 592 million to acquire a company to do screening. That's just a start. Uh, am I up against uh, an impossible challenge? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, we're thinking our way through some of the more difficult challenges and uh, things are working out. But boy, if I had that kind of resource, it'd be really neat. Um, so why don't I, I leave that story? Um, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to. Uh, for those that want to follow up and uh, find out more about uh, the cystic fibrosis, the, the latest breakthrough in uh, cystic fibrosis work. Is Andre on the line yet? I think so. Awesome. Awesome. I don't have video, though. Oh, well, we do. Is there a photo of you on the internet? Uh, <laughs> that might be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> So we've had some uh, technical difficulties, um, in part because there's been a breakdown of the studio in Petaluma to uh, move the uh, technology across town to the uh, brick house, and um, we're using a more conventional analog uh, methodologies and a new version of Skype that hasn't been too, uh, um, uh, you know, effective. So we, we finally got Andre Nantel on the line. He's a senior research officer at the BRI, the Biotechnology Research Institute, Microarray Lab, uh, National Research Council of Canada and Montreal. Welcome, Andre. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Oh, man, it's, it's good to have you. It's like it's that next story. That, that, so I, I, I've I already described the cystic fibrosis story and uh, the discovery of uh, or the, 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 a molecule that's gone past phase uh, three clinical trials for CF patients. Um, but the next story, the autoantigen uh, discovery with the synthetic uh, peptidome, I don't want to do without having uh, you drill me with questions because that's going to help get the story across. Uh, if I just say it, tell the story, it's going to be um, pretty thick. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got that story, we've got Andre's story, and we have um, uh, Justin on the line with uh, uh, w one of his papers that he wants to that, that I've asked him to present. So how about we, uh, you, Andre, do you want to warm up slowly and uh, we ha we'll have uh, Justin present his paper, then go on to the, the genetics? I fully agree because two minutes before coming online, I was still cleaning up my basement and suddenly I went like, oh, it's, it's five to four. Oh, God, I'm supposed to be on Twitter now. <laughs> So, yeah, right. giving me a few minutes to catch up and get, get my brain back into science mode as we're spending two hours in the most disgusting room of my house would be just awesome. All right, cool. Well, before we start, though, Bonne Saint-Jean, André. Merci beaucoup. It's <laughs> right. rainy, cold, and windy, so it's perfect. This is going to be the day where the greatest number of houses in the province of Quebec are going to be immaculately clean because everything is closed and weather sucks, so everybody's staying home, and so we might as well clean the house and do video games. <laughs> a lot of newborns next March. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be this Not cold. for me. <laughs> Your kids are almost in college, if not in college. All right. In uh, so, um, so, Justin, uh, perhaps you could present your symbiotic brain-machine interface through value-based decision-making. And, uh, by the way, we're going to interrupt you with a million questions. So, okay. uh, definitely. Perfect. I, I love questions. 
All right. But uh, since it's a Friday and uh, we're talking science, let's uh, yeah, kind of take a step back a little bit and, and start thinking uh, about things uh, and, and maybe even dreaming a little bit. So, um, so uh, this paper that uh, just came out, it, the concept for it really started um, a long time ago. And um, we were very intrigued uh, with the idea of how um, both young kids learn to do certain things, you know, learn, learn to uh, uh, perform motor tasks and things like that uh, throughout their childhood. And we're also very intrigued by the idea of how animals and humans um, have learned to survive in their environments through the concept of, of reinforcement learning, meaning that um, as they perform behaviors while interacting with the environment, there are certain behaviors that lead them to things that they want. And there are certain behaviors that lead them to things that they don't want, right? And um, uh, the brains of both humans and animals have, have adapted very nicely to reward, you know, both chemically uh, and electrophysiologically, the kinds of things that are really good for your survival, right? And, uh, you know, these, these kinds of concepts have been studied for many, many years in the psychology circles and neuroscience circles. And we started asking the question is, could we bring in those concepts of, uh, of reward and reinforcement into our interaction with computers and devices and prosthetics and, and things of this nature? So basically merging the biological systems with artificial systems, but through that concept of, of reinforcement learning. And you know, we can start to ask, you know, why would that be important? Why would that be interesting to us? And to, to put it very simply is, if that device, right, this electronic device, could share with you your brain's representation of things that are rewarding or uh, reinforcing, it may be able to enable you to do things that are much more, much more powerful, right? It could potentially learn with you as you are trying to control this device. And um, you know, I, I, I explain this to people in, in a very simple way. I say, just think if your computer had some idea of what your goals were, right? Then it could, in essence, assist you in achieving some of those goals, right? Right now, when we interact with computers, they're all completely uh, input-driven, right? We, we just give them commands and they execute those commands. And we are thinking in a way now that we can interact with a computer or a device in a much more rich way by sharing in these kind of, of goal kind of signals. And uh, so that's what we set out to do. And, that's scary. And wait, wait a minute. Is this legal? Because <laughs> here I'm thinking. So you're, it, it, let me see if I understand this correctly. You're going to develop a device. You've got a device that while you interact with your environment is going to reinforce the positive signals that your brain typically generates during a successful uh, outcome with the environment. Is that, well, I don't know, does that exactly make sense? Right. So, for example, if I eat a piece of chocolate and it's really good, my body says, wow, this is great. Bring out and a then, flow of serotonin every time you see Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's more of a sleep. Anyway, that's, so. Uh, evil usage. <laughs> evil usage. Well, I don't know. She's got some appeal. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's interesting. Uh, but it's, it's, it's easier to say from north of the border. Let me just say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you're down here, it's kind of so. Um, if you so you eat a piece of chocolate, or you go out into the bright sun on a, a 72 degree day, or you go for a swim on a hot, hot day, your brain releases a bunch of um, uh, uh, responses, and you're trying to capture those responses similar to that, so that when you're trying to do something difficult with a brain machine interface, trying to train your brain to use that interface, which may be close to impossible, very difficult, that it's going to talk back to you and say that you're doing it correctly. Yeah, so it's essentially merging together your, your motor intent, right? Your intent to do physical kinds of things with those internal reward signals that are in your brain. And the idea is really to send both of those pieces of information to whatever device that you're trying to control. And that through analyzing that information in real time while you're interacting with it, that you could potentially do something much more sophisticated uh, than without that kind of information, right? Would it so, speed up um, the learning? Uh, well, this one thing that we have, you know, thought about, and we haven't exactly tested this yet, but 
Yes, right? Let's say your environment changes or your brain representation of the environment changes. If you have access to those reinforcing kind of signals, one may be able to speed up or respond more efficiently to those kinds of changes, right? So how do you and, test that? Yes, so, so very interesting question. Um, we're doing two things. So we're doing um, uh, both animal and human kind of research where we record from both the motor part of the brain and the reward centers of the brain. And then we are developing sophisticated algorithms, computational kinds of models that can uh, translate that activity into control commands for devices. And we can put those control uh, modules under a variety of different conditions and test whether things adapt faster or adapt slower or, um, or how they respond to, to perturbations. So, um, so yeah, we, you have to, one of the key issues that one has to develop if you want to do this is you have to construct what is called a closed loop neural interface. So the user and this device that is taking in uh, the motor and reward signals have to both be working together simultaneously in closed loop. And uh, it's through that continuous reaction th through which you can observe the changes and really see the outcomes uh, uh, over time. And, can you describe uh, so, the devices so that we can sort of visualize it? Yeah, so um, the, the general concept for building these uh, first involves putting an implant into the brain, so uh, some kind of micro device that can extract the firings of the neurons in your brain. And then you essentially send that information to a computer that has what we call a decoding algorithm that can perform this reinforcement learning process, but in silicon, and then it will translate all of that information into a control for either the computer cursor or a prosthetic arm or uh, any, any number of devices that you can, can think about, right? Um, and you know, there, there are many questions that really have to be addressed in order to kind of study this process, right? How the brain uh, represents information, both rewarding and motor information, how that kind of information changes over time. Uh, and then on the engineering side, how does one develop algorithms uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, interpret it in real time and respond to it in the most efficient way possible? So we have not only biological questions to, to understand and neuro questions, but we have a whole lot of engineering questions that we also have to address in order to bring these kinds of things to reality. Are the algorithms the same for women and men? Ah, very interesting question. <laughs> and the children, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we haven't we haven't uh, addressed gender differences and how the reward system and motor system uh, encode information at this point in time. <laughs> but I may be inclined to think that the coding may be a little different, right? A little. <laughs> and, <laughs> a lot different, of course. Yeah. So, so, I, so we. I have another uh, question, though. I'm tr I'm still trying to imagine how this thing looks. Um, how do you get into connections between the machine and the brain? Is it like surgical implants, or is it just on the surface of the of the skull? Um, yeah. So, how so does what this we're work? Doing, we're actually building uh, surgical kinds of implants um, into the brain. So we 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 uh, make a, a little what we call craniotomy into the skull and put devices into the brain. But in this area of neural prosthetics or brain machine interfaces, there are a variety of both invasive and non-invasive uh, kinds of approaches. Um, since we're very interested in, in understanding on the very elementary level of how the brain encodes information, we have to kind of go invasively uh, in order to do that. But there are a few options that are out there um, that can, can blend both of them. Are they commercially available? There are um, a couple uh, commercial, uh, even com uh, consumer devices that are attempting uh, to uh, build brain machine kind of uh, connections but they don't operate anywhere near the level that we're describing here today. So this idea of reinforcement learning and taking reward and motor information uh, and, and this kind of perception, action, reward uh, uh, cycle, there's nothing really that, that's out there right now. So this is the, the bleeding edge, what we're talking about. Are you getting a, a lot of volunteers? Yeah. yeah, so, um, so right now, um, there are a, there's a large population of patients with either spinal cord injury or amputation or even things like ALS whose quality of life is is severely diminished right and by 
interacting with some of these devices, they can regain a, a sense of normalcy. And uh, there's, there's a lot of work to really bring the technology to a point where it's um, extremely clinically viable. So, you know, a lot of us are working, as I said, in the bleeding edge to just show the proof of concept. But now in the next, I would say, 10 years, 5 to 10 years, the push is really to make them robust and clinically viable. And, and maybe uh, one last question. Do you see a lot of variability between individuals' ability to, to do these types of interaction? I mean, for example, the 3D movie, some people can handle it quite fine. Others just can't. And I was wondering if, if, if certain people are genetically or for some other reasons more amenable to that type of machine brain interactions. Yeah, so that, that's a wonderful question. Um, everybody's brain that at least I have observed in these kinds of contexts, they encode their intent and their rewards a little bit differently. And we actually, when we build these algorithms to decode the information, we tailor them to the specific individual. So, uh, so yeah, there are, there are variances in, in all of these things, but we do have the capability uh, in, in order to tailor them. And, you know, th that's a great thing, right, to be able to engineer something that uh, is, is specifically, you know, fit for, for that particular individual. Can you make mine Mac OS? <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but you know, you, you bring up a, a very important question it is about, uh, you know, I, I would say that you are, are talking about Mac OS because of its robustness and its ease of use and things like that. And Just ease of use, yeah. Right, th those same kind of issues come up in these prosthetic devices, right? How does one build something that is easy to use um, and robust? One sec, we're, we're getting some yeah. noise. Uh, are, are you in a lab? Just one I don't know if that's coming from my end. Oh, sorry. So Andre looks like he. Oh yeah, he's um, he's got had some interference. Okay, so we're yeah. uh, so we're back. So yeah. we're talking about the robustness of. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll wait to the. Okay, so we're talking about the robustness of the signals. Yeah. Uh, yeah, robustness and, uh, and, and ease of use. And if um, you know, we've gotten a lot of inspiration from biology, right? If you look at how have biological systems become very robust in, in these kinds of situations is that they learn over time, right? There's this process of reinforcement that you, you take a concept, you apply it in your environment, and then depending upon the outcome of those things, you may change your strategy for, for, uh, for interacting with the environment. And we can take those same concepts and build them into engineered devices. And yeah, I would say that that concept is very foreign in, in the hardware uh, mindset right now. We typically think of building hardware or even software to, to do one thing and, and do one thing very well. But we're taking a completely different approach to that. We are taking, looking at these from like an adaptive point of view where you're you know, probing, seeing the outcomes of those uh, uh, actions, and then using the information that you learned to help update it and make it even better. And that's really where this kind of interaction between reward and intent comes into play. So you're taking it to the next level, though. Okay, so you've got a brain-machine interface capable of detecting a, a brain signal. You've had algorithms to interpret those uh, brain signals. And you can then, now you're trying to find out how to send signals back into the brain with the proper stimulation to, to create a, uh, a positive or negative? Uh, well, well, not necessarily send information back into the brain yet, but maybe tap into those circuits in the brain that give you some evaluated feedback for how well that you are doing. And if we can get that piece of information to our devices, our devices will know kind of our satisfaction for using them, right? Um, Right now, all of the devices that you or I would interact with, they have no idea for how satisfied we are with their interaction, how well they're performing. And because of that, they're, they're kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, they're kind of dumb in that situation, right? And um, this whole brain-machine uh, interface idea using both motor and reward systems completely knocks down those barriers. And it says, yes, let's share the goal between user and computer. And if they can do that, possibly they could work in a more efficient or better way, a more robust way. Or symbiotic way. Or symbiotic way. So, you know, it's, it's interesting we, we're using the idea symbiotic. It, actually, the term symbiosis came out in the 1960s by a guy named Licklider, back when the, the field of cybernetics was, was being designed. 
And uh, they also had this idea that by sharing something with a computer uh, that you could do a little bit better. But back in the 60s, they really didn't have the technology to interface with the brain. And I think that that's what we do have today. We, we can interface with the brain in a variety of ways. We can go to a variety of the parts uh, of the brain and extract that information and try to use it in, in a little bit better way and, and maybe even deliver this idea of symbiosis. Where do you see this being applied, uh, you know, in, um, in patients, in military, in uh, sports and improvement of uh, human capabilities? Yeah. So I, always immediately, uh, these kinds of bleeding edge technologies, they can help the disabled individual, right? Whether it's, uh, mm -hmm. again, a patient coming back from, from, uh, from battle, some of our soldiers that are overseas, or if it's just a patient that was in a serious car injury, right? They are going to be the immediate uh, beneficiaries from these kinds of things. But one thing that, you know, I've really been thinking about deeply is just this whole concept of how we interact with devices. If we think about it in a little bit deeper way, right, it, it may change the way that we interact with devices. And, you know, one may not necessarily need a brain implant in, in the long term, but if we could build devices that are a little bit more intelligent that can, can cue into what some of our goals are, then maybe we can change the paradigm a little bit. And uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how all of this unfolds. I mean, we have a, a tremendous amount to learn, right, both of how the brain works and how to engineer hardware. So there, there's a, a, lot, a lot more things that have to be done before all of this becomes a reality. But I think that it, it is a reality that we can achieve at some point. Well, you know, I asked uh, Eric Kendall if there would be a day we'd have USB in the back of our head. And whether what, what did he say? <laughs> he, he said, what? <laughs> He's a Nobel laureate. He said, what? Right. Then he it said, oh, yeah. It'll it'll Thunderbolt. <laughs> <laughs> you want Thunderbolt, right, yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, maybe in 100 years. But, you know, then, then we had a, a follow-up show uh, with you, Justin, and, and you were saying, go wireless, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is uh, the absolute way to go. This yeah. is. Yeah, man, it's really, really neat stuff. And you combine it with some of the, uh, what they would call opti optogenetics, you know, ah, uh, yes. you've got, can you, you know, reverse, uh, you not only activate sort of electrical potentials, you know, um, you could go in and activate genes under yeah. control uh, for, you know, perhaps someone who has a neurological disorder, you restore the expression of the correct genes to, to restore the health of the neurons or uh, glial cells or whatnot, and then you go in and use a combination of optogenetic uh, BMI chip, right? You can yeah. go back and forth and control the molecular biology of the cell and the physiology of the cell at the same time, all wirelessly. Yes, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up this idea, that the optogenetic kind of techniques, because you, you said, you know, how do we deliver information back to the brain? And you know, I would say that that's one of the most difficult challenges uh, trying to be addressed right now. We have no way of really, really writing in an efficient way the information back. And there are a few groups that are out there that are trying to use these optogenetic techniques that you can modulate very specific neurons uh, in the brain. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, only time will tell with that. But uh, yeah, we need a lot of creative ideas. So if anybody's out there that knows how to modulate neurons in an efficient and effective way, you know, that could be a, a, a nice uh, piece of work. You know, Justin, one of the reasons why we do these panel shows is to, to come up with some ideas as to where we want to take the show next. And I think uh, if we could pull you on as a guest host on that and you could, uh, you know, find out who you'd like to talk to uh, to really bridge that scientific gap of the, bio, the, 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 the uh, brain machine interface and, and, and bring optogenetics into your lab. Because uh, I think you'd do pretty well with it. Yeah. It would be really cool. So we could seek out some scientists working on that. That'd sure. Really that would cool. be wonderful. Um, are you feeling a little bit more sciencey, Andre? Uh, yep, Andre. <laughs> I'd say we do yours first, since it's a little bit heavier, and All mine right. is mine's almost like a dessert. So we'll do it this one last. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks, Justin. That was an. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, I really encourage you to uh, keep up your work. There was a question in the in the chat room. They want me to ask you about your DARPA work. Everybody said, uh -huh. tell, ask him about his DARPA work. Can you talk about your DARPA work? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we can talk about that. And um, I, I'm glad somebody mentioned that. And, um, y you know, um, so let me take a step back. You know, we always hear from 
uh, our president that um, innovation is something that will drive our country uh, into the future. And that, that's a concept that I believe very heavily in. And it's uh, going after really big science and big ideas that can really transform uh, our culture and, and, and our technologies. I, I think that's something that we have to go after. And it's something that's been lost uh, over the last maybe 10, 15, 20 years, we've become very conservative about these kinds of things. And um, one of the wonderful things of why I like working for DARPA is that they do go after these big science kinds of ideas and they invest heavily in them and they, they see the potential for going after, you know, things that could transform our lives. And, um, and you know, they have been, uh, again, Big, big supporters of, of these kinds of things that, that we're working on. And it's not, not only my lab that is involved in these kinds of things. There are many other labs working on neural interfaces that are trying to uh, really advance technologies that can improve our lives. We, it's, it's, it's amazing that, um, you know, the Army grants are, and contracts, uh, tenders, are there, 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 there are, there's a serious element of civilian um, uh, you know, out, uh, benefit to the uh, civilian population, and that's a considerable element in the in the review process. And also, the the army has uh, and, the, and the navy and the air force they have these uh, these um, sort of strong community initiatives to tackle issues, even like breast cancer. And uh, so, it's not all military medicine research is going to be towards improving the the uh, the you know soldier. Uh, capability or the the strength of the future force. It's going to be also about taking care of that future force health, right? Which improves the strength of the of the future force, but not 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 as super super individuals, you know. But uh, so that's really really uh it's a really good point, um, Justin. Uh, that you know it does does translate. Um, yeah. Let's, gotta, let's, you gotta try to, just one last thing, you gotta go after tough problems, right? And if you don't go after tough problems, then uh, you, know, you get stuck. <laughs> well, the military so, are exposed yeah. to such dramatic environmental conditions that, uh, the, you know, they suffer. And uh, medicine is always to try and help the, the outcome for those people that are injured and whatnot, and injured, diseased. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it's it's good good for people to go out there and and try to apply for these army grants and not necessarily think that oh they're just helping to make a better bomb they're going out there to create uh, a, a better cure um, and, right. and we're working on brain swelling from uh, from brain trauma so uh, the army is a, a definitely a viable approach for financing our research um, so <laughs> how about I I, I start the uh, the auto antigen discovery story, and Andre, you know, feel free to feel sciency and ask as many questions as you want because I I hope I don't uh, hack this up. So this is I'm gonna I'm gonna present a paper uh, from uh, Benjamin Larman. He's the first author. Last author is Stephen uh, Stephen uh, Elledge, Elledge, and um, I think this is from uh, this came out of Cambridge, Mass. Uh, from Harvard, and uh, I'll, I'll put the link to the paper. It was in Nature of Biotechnology. One of the big technical problems that I've been thinking about is, um, say you have a, a patient with multiple sclerosis or an autoimmune disease where their body cannot distinguish between self and non-self. They have antibodies going to bind to proteins in their body that they shouldn't be attacking. And the the big question, even in in many conditions of multiple sclerosis, for example, is nobody knows what that protein is. If only you could find out what that protein, their own antibodies are are binding, you could develop a strategy to block that interaction rather than give a general um, immunosuppressant drug. Right? Why do you want to turn off the immune system? You don't want to turn off the immune system. You just want to knock out that one protein interaction between the antibody and the what they call the antigen. The antigen is the protein that your antibodies stick to, targeting it for, for destruction by the immune system. So uh, there, what people have done in the past is they've constructed what they call cDNA libraries. A cDNA library is a complementary DNA library. It's, it's little strands of DNA in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of clones, right, individual segments. And they've expressed it in the genome of a phage. A phage is a little virus that attacks E. coli. 
right? And in doing so, it makes the protein, it takes the DNA, makes the protein in the simplest con con genetic construct possible, exposing the protein on the surface of the capsid of the phage virus. Then what you could do is take your, your, uh, your uh, cerebral spinal fluid where there's antibodies, or somebody has a neurological disorder that's an autoimmune disease, and then it put the two together and find out which phage are, uh, are binding to the antibodies. And you pull down the antibodies, there's biochemical techniques for pulling down antibodies, and then sequence the, uh, the cDNA to find out what is the protein segment that, that these antibodies recognize. The problem with that is that cDNA libraries are made by taking somebody's RNA, translating it to uh, complementary DNA, and the RNA is biased. It's biased for the cell type that you're using. It's biased for the genes that are highly expressed versus non-expressed. There's not a true representation of the entire human proteome. Does that make sense, Andre? Yeah, and not to, make, not to forget also that a lot of uh, antigens in the human body are glycoproteins. So they're, they're proteins, but they're modified with sugar residue or other modifications that are simply not reflected in an E. coli-based expression system. So right. any antibody that recognizes that type of antigen is not going to be picked up by this method. That's the first one. The right. second That's one a is problem. oh yeah. yeah the other problem is C, C, expressing cDNA from a mammalian source into E. coli is very inefficient. You're probably you're going to be lucky if you express 30% of the proteins. Right. So th this is going to be a problem with this paper as well. Even though they have a new technique that eliminates the bias of difficult expression the bias of, you know, in, in E. coli, the difficult expression or the, the, the difficult um, uh, post-translational modifications. When protein is made in your body, it's, as you said, it's got glycosylation, it's got phosphorylation, it's got, uh, it has uh, uh, proteases that act on it. It has um, all kinds of... Sumoylation, ubiquitination. Uh, there's so many modifications beyond phosphorylation. It's quite impressive. Phosphorylation right, right. is the, the cute girl of the gang, but it's not the uh, only one. Right. As, as, as John Bergeron says, there's billions of proteins. <laughs> so there's 24,000 open reading frames. Our human genome contains, uh, they use 24,239 open reading frames. That means segments in our DNA that actually code for protein. Uh, they said, but out of 24,000, 23 were predicted to make protein. They looked perfect. Right. So, um, it, it, you know, with all the possible post-translational modifications, everything that a cell can do to a protein, you've got billions of combinations. Okay, but that being said, okay, so what did this group do to help develop a technique that could take somebody's um, serum and identify how that serum interacts with uh, proteins to identify where it's going wrong, where is the antibody that's recognizing self when it shouldn't. So um, what they did is they... They, they went nuts. They, 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 they used the, the build 35 1 of the human genome, 24,000 open reading frames. They divided each open reading frame, open reading frame being the part of the DNA that encodes for a gene, into 36 amino acid peptides, right? So uh, for every amino acid, uh, there's three uh, codons. So they made small little segments of synthetic genes using a DNA synthesizer and had the DNA synthesizers hooked up to a computer and pumping out synthetic genes that they encoded for 36 amino acid proteins. And they overlapped them by seven residues, which, so the 36, then 36, and 36, but they were overlapping slightly, and then 30, then, uh, it's hard to do it in reverse, but so the overlapping by seven amino, uh, seven, uh, amino acids. So uh, these, these little segments of protein were made in a way that could cover the entire proteome with overlap of where an antibody typically recognizes a protein, which in a linear stretch is roughly about seven amino acids. Okay, so they made 413,000 uh, uh, constructs uh, and basically 413,000 peptides spanning the entire coding region of the human genome. Um, you know, I, I could go into some detail here. They used uh, releasable DNA microarrays, 19 pools of 22,000 oligos. None of that really makes any sense to me, although those, those like Andre, it's, ah, of course. Right? Okay, so... <laughs> oh, 
some some kind of deconvolution is probably being involved in the sense that they're not individual pools, but it could be like depending on which peptides you put into which wells, depending on which wells light up, you're able to calculate, okay, the only this peptide would give you exactly this pattern of uh, of binding. That's one possibility that how they did that. Yeah, well, that's why uh, you you can do this kind of big science. So, so then what? So the idea is now you have a library of phage. These are the, the little E. coli viruses, right? Um, but that have a little segment. Each one has a little segment of the human proteome. Has a little human in it, right? And then if you pool, take your test tube and you put a virus made from these four hundred thirteen thousand different human constructs. You're going to have a whole human, basically, in a test tube, based on the expression of uh, on the viral capsid, so that you've got 413. Well, a, a whole human that's been put into a blender for a very, very long time, but yes, <laughs> into a blender of 36 amino acids, right? Which is fantastic, and you've got an even representation. They did this. Now they're using high throughput sequencing, and they were able to. You can go in and then sequence a, a sample of this. And they, they found that they had actual 92% coverage of expected clones, right? More importantly, 78% of the library was within a tenfold abundance. So now you had the human proteome evenly spread out, well, of course, in a nanodrop, but um, evenly spread out and, and uniform. So now, with this in hand, all you do is take the person's cerebral spinal fluid, if they have neurological disorder, and take the antibodies, mix them with this, the, the, the E. coli virus expressing the human proteome and if there's going to be an interaction between the antibodies and the, the proteome in the phage you're going to be able to purify it biochemically there's, a, there's a, a reagent called protein A and there's another one called protein G and the, the team optimized these washing conditions these are little beads they actually weigh they have some weight to them and they bind antibodies so you've got your cerebral spinal fluid with antibodies you've got your uh, your library you add your protein A, protein G, and you centrifuge it out. You wash. The beads will fall to the bottom. You add some buffer. You resuspend it. You spin it down again. And you're basically washing away everything that's nonspecific. And then is, there, all you is there several cycles of purification, amplifications of, of viruses? Because this is where phages are very powerful. Initially, you have, a very, you have billions and billions of phages representing the entire human proteome. But these interactions with DNA, they're not extremely specific, especially if you're looking for binding to a linear sequence. But where it gets powerful is that you do a purification once, you purify some of the phages, then you yep. put phages in E. coli and they make baby phages of the yes. same genomes. They make well, even they more and you purify several cycles like that. And essentially what you do is you enrich in the phages that will bind to these antibodies. Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> they did uh, subjected enriched phage populations. Okay, because you enrich the, the phage that are cross-reacting to the, the human patient's antibodies. And they did PCR amplification and deep sequencing DNA analysis. Does that make sense? So they, yep. they did PCR amplification. And um, so that's pretty wild. Now you have a technique that can give you the best possible coverage of the genome and find out what proteins are actually interacting with that person's immune system. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this story up because, you know, there's a lot of people out there, and, and you may know some with diseases where the antigen isn't known. And I, I, I'm faced with this, this situation, and I'm trying to, like, how we're going to go about uh, correcting this. And if you had an antibody and you know what that antibody is recognizing and you already know it down to 36 amino acids, all you simply have to do now is give that person an injection of that peptide. You make the peptide in a robot, in a peptide-making robot. Uh, um, the person who invented that machine, by the way, um, Lee Hood, has been on the show twice. So you get his machine. He's making the... Um, uh, you, you make the, the peptide and you inject them and now you're competing the antibodies binding to the, uh, to the protein in their, their neurological system and you're killing that binding. You don't have to stop the whole immune system. You just have to stop that single antibody. So this technique has now opened the door, uh, while it has problems, has opened the door to neurological disorders, um, to uh, type 1 diabetes, to lupus, you know, to a, a whole slew of diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is a major, major medical problem, unmet medical need. So this is really neat. Now, uh, do you have, you have a question, Andre? Well, there's, there's a couple of limitations into that methods that have right. to be taken into account. Uh, and we had a big project where we were trying to make 
uh, hundreds of monoclonal antibodies against dozens and dozens of uh, cancer-related proteins. And initially, our first run through for this project was to use peptides as the antigens. And we were very good at making anti-peptide monoclonals antibody. The problem is, is they wouldn't rarely recognize the folded full-length proteins to which the peptides were derived. So the methods will work fantastic for these antibodies that whose antigen is just a linear sequence of peptides, but there's a lot of ant antibodies out there that will recognize, uh, for example, their, their epitope is like two branches, two different branches of the polypeptides that are together in the three-dimensional structure, but they're not together in the linear structure, so they will never get picked up in a, um, in a strategy such as that one. That's the first limitation. The other limitation is any antibodies that recognize modified proteins, as we said in the beginning, whether it's glycosylation or other, other modifications, it's not going to get picked up as well. So it's, it's the kind of strategy that's really great. It'll give you a positive result, maybe very informative to identify what the potential target of these antibody is. Uh, the profile themselves may be tremendously interesting. I mean, it almost gives you like a a very complex picture of what that person's immune system is. So I can see a lot of potential there, but I would not be surprised if there's a lot of cases where it simply won't work because the, even though you have billions of different phages sequences, the, the diversity is just not complex enough. What if you were to make the full length open reading frames and use an expression system such as uh, the uh, insect uh, expression system, uh, baculovirus, with it, you where you have a human mimetic cell line that has all the the mammalian uh, cellular modifications. That I guess could work. Would it, would I it mean, boost your pool, right? Oh, well, this is version one. This it's is, doing this in high <laughs> throughput, but I mean, you never know how smart people can figure out things. First, you do it in a small scale, in a small sequence, and then. Wow. Pretty soon you have a, a much better system. I won't say maybe baculo, but there are probably viral systems out there that can be um, co-opted into making longer sequences that would be more better antigens. Well, I have to say that my wife cloned all the genes of the human, uh, or most of them, of the human uh, orpheome um, as a project for Invitrogen to, uh, to make the protein microarrays. The, uh, the issue with that is it becomes extremely expensive and, um, you know, difficult to do in, in every lab, I suppose. There, there might be other reasons where it might actually be more useful. And you take the person's cerebral spinal fluid, run it on a microarray with the human, entire human proteome expressed in full-length proteins. And, wow, but it's, that might be um, doable. But at least this – so let, let me give you an example of how it worked. So they didn't just do, do – set it up to tr to try like set it up they tried it and what they did is they took um patients with something called uh paraneoplastic neurological syndromes now para paraneoplastic neurological syndromes at the interface of autoimmunity disease right and uh, and cancer whereas uh, if you have cancer your body might develop an immunity to it because there's new proteins and proteins in a different abundance, something that might have been very rare and now is high abundance, uh, that is now made, you develop an immunity to it, and then now you have an immunity to it, you have antibodies, they go and attack the parts of the body where that protein was originally found. So the cancer cells are, are kind of um, screwed up that way. Now, and there's, there's one, you know, the paraneoplastic neurological syndromes are that exact case where you have a cancer you develop an immunity towards that cancer, great, that's, that's a good thing. But then now you have an autoimmune disease where you've got neurological disorders because there's uh, a crosstalk between your immunity now. You've got new antibodies and you're, and you're starting to have autoimmune disease. Well, the, okay, the, so the, the potential for immune profiling is kind of staggeringly cool. I mean, imagine if you could run a test like this. And depending on which profiles you obtain, you might be able to say, oh, suddenly you're getting cancer markers for this type of cancer into your immune system, you may not even know that you have a certain tumor in your body, but your immune system does. And depending on the profile you're getting, you might be able to link it to different pathologies. It has a lot of potentials beyond simply autoimmune diseases. Yeah, this, you know, this is going to be one, one, one program in the tricorder. <laughs> it's going to be, so they, they took patient A who was a 63-year-old female who had a non-small cell lung cancer and found to have PND, okay, so post uh, perineoplastic neurological syndrome. But her, she did a panel of antibodies 
they know there's certain antigens already. They've discovered a few, and one of them is called NOVA, Neuro uh, Oncological Ventral Antigen. That's the name of it, called NOVA. Right. So she has a, a protein in her body that's getting attacked by her immune system, and they know it's NOVA. So what they did is they tested this system to see if it would pull out NOVA. And it did, it did actually pull out NOVA. They also pulled out SAPK4, which was a positive control peptide, which they threw into the sample. But it also pulled out six other candidate autoantigens. So this person's auto immune system wasn't just attacking NOVA1, but it was attacking potentially others. They tested three. And how did they test the three? Well, they actually took a mammalian cell line. They took the genes that were identified, expressed them, and then tested them by immunoblotting, which means they use the cerebral spinal fluid uh, of the patient and s look to see if there was a cross-reaction to those autoantigens. And one of them, TGIF2LX, uh, you got to love biotech, TG TGFB-induced factor homeobox 2-like X-linked. So it was confirmed as a novel autoantigen for uh, PND, for um, paraneoplastic neurological syndrome. So they identified a new potential autoimmune uh, autoantigen. So a protein that the body recognizes as self, as non-self when it's supposed to be self. Uh, okay, so that that's pretty cool. They did they did find the one they were expecting, and they found a new one. Well, uh, they went to patient B, 59 year old female with a dysarthria, ataxia, head tibutation. Uh, I don't. I'm I'm not an MD. Uh, muscular rigidity, but. It, when, test, when her serum was tested against the panel of perineoplastic antibody, uh, and for antibodies, they, they found it was negative. So, um, of the, they, they took the, the, the sample, or the serum from patient B, and mixed it with their library of uh, phage uh, expressing the human proteome, and they found three autoantigens. One of them was, guess what? TGIF2LX. Um, so they confirmed in a second patient that the new autoantigen that they found in patient A was actually a neuroantigen in patient B. They also found cancer testis antigen 2 and uh, glutamate decarboxylase uh, 2. So they found uh, three and they verified them and that person had antibodies against these three autoantigens. So now you have a potential um, uh, methodology for treating this patient. But okay, so next step. Patient C. They developed this patient developed melanoma and an unusual horizontal uh, gaze uh, palsy. Right. They tested this person. They found uh, using the system. The uh, they took their serum, mixed it in with their, the library of phage, and identified um, uh, was it two family members of the trim family of proteins. So two trim uh, proteins, trim sixty seven, which is highly expressed in melanoma, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Here's an antigen in a cancer cell, TRIM67, and they found TRIM9, which is a brain-specific E3 ubiquitin ligase. So it's a brain protein involved in the cascade of degradation of proteins, and that's important in cell homeostasis and, and a, lot of, a lot of functions. But that being said, they found <clears throat> TRIM67, but a highly related a family member called TRIM9. And they, they, this suggests that there's potential crosstalk of immunity Whereas you might have an autoimmune disease that recognizes a cancer cell, it might then go recognize a different protein, but a family member in a different uh, tissue. Um, so this overall, the work of um, of uh, Benjamin Larman and uh, you know uh, Zenman Zhao, Lars Laserson, uh, Lee Chikia Martinez, Kikak. This <laughs> oh I, God I missed it George Church is on this paper for God's sakes there um, you go <laughs> there you go Santos, that's a name that rings sorry. a bell he's been on the show a number of times he's fantastic exactly and, um, uh, he's probably involved in some of the sequencing elements because they're, they're in Har they're at Harvard and they're sequencing um, and uh, he's very very uh, has very very um, developed incredible approaches he was the individual I was talking about who put the uh, Who's, who's planning on putting a, a DNA sequencer on Mars. So, uh, so that's kind of great. So what I would do with, with this, if, if I was, would be to run running back, like I was saying, that, that has a lot of potential for almost general diagnostic purposes because now you're getting markers for cancer from human genes. But it's very simple to take that library of human proteins and add on uh, proteins from, let's say, every known human pathogen or bacteria or viruses that occasionally inhabit our, our system. 
And then depending on the profile that you get, you might be able to diagnose, to diagnose a lot of things. Essentially, you're asking your immune system, what, what is worrying you right now? And the immune system, well, that one is annoying. That one I'm binding to. And depending on what proteins you get, you might be able to identify pathologies. So it's, I mean, I've, and considering how fast next-gen sequencing technologies is going, uh, this, is, this, is a pro, this is essentially a, an assay that can be done very, very quickly. You could probably get uh, plasma or cerebral spinal fluid in one day, uh, do the binding assay in an hour or two, especially with magnetic beads, then do the PCR in an hour, send it off to sequencing. Two hours later, you got the, you got the profiles out. That has trem- I hope they patented it because that has <laughs> tremendous potential. <laughs> You're talking like Agent Scully in the X uh, X Files. You know, she was always able to sequence DNA back in the '90s in in two hours, right? You do the southern oh. blots in like an hour to determine whether or not she was alien, and she did it two hours. It takes overnight to do a southern blot. Right, uh, well, don't Agent get me Scully. started when they were showing her doing a southern blot. And they were, she was putting the <laughs> the nucleotides directly into the southern solution because yeah. they were like uh, they were red dyed. So you would say, "Wait a minute, you're supposed to do labeling before putting it in and there." Anyway, yeah. details. Yeah, but you know, n- yeah, it's fine. It was a fun show. <laughs> but hey, let's you know, this is totally geeking out here. Um, yeah, so it, it it introduces one a new methodology for rapid diagnosis of uh, uh, immune uh, auto immune disorders too it um it brings potential therapeutics to the forefront right away so okay you make the peptide the peptide's not fully folded maybe you do need um, a fully formed protein well you can make that fully formed protein and if somebody asked me to make a therapeutic protein it would take me probably about six weeks and i could make a grams of the protein in the lab it's not it would cost maybe a hundred thousand dollars but if it extends that person's lifespan by 20 years you know, it would be tremendous, and it would be very, very non-toxic to make uh, uh, proteins. That uh, it would be the opposite of non-toxic. It would be extremely beneficial if you could tighter out uh, that person's uh, autoimmune antibodies. So uh, that's why I thought this was a, a fun story. And uh, you know, uh, I'll put a link up again to the, as I said before, into the show notes. If somebody wants to go and uh, find the paper, they can find it. It's a, it's a great example of. Uh, you know, non-traditional drug discovery, non-traditional uh, molecular medicine. You know, it's 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 a very uh, uh, inspiring story. Um, we Justin is battery is dying, so we're gonna he's gonna disconnect probably and uh, fetch a, uh, <laughs> a connector. Uh, we biotechnologists aren't necessarily the most computer, but he's a, he is. All right, are you? Do you have your battery back? Uh, no, no, I haven't hooked it up yet. I was hanging in there to the last possible minute. All right, I'll, okay. I'll find a power cord, huh? All right, cool. So, Andre, um, I think we're doing okay on time. So, uh, how about you uh, you describe the story that you picked uh, for us? All right. So, the, t- the story I picked up uh, is from Nature, not one of the small Nature, the big Nature journal. <laughs> and essentially, it's a team uh, led by Matthias Selbach from the uh, Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine. So, that's in uh, Berlin, Germany. And they essentially found the perfect way of getting a Nature paper which is you find a very simple question that will interest pretty much every biologist that there is, (laughs) and you answer it in the most elegant way possible. So the question that they're asking is, how how do you get different protein levels inside a cell? And the way you determine that, there's four processes that determine how much protein is inside a cell. You get the rate of transcription, the rate of messenger RNA degradation, how fast are the messenger RNAs translated, and how fast is the protein degraded. And there's been a lot of studies comparing uh, messenger RNA and protein levels done to date. Uh, That's always been, um, especially when a lot of us doing microarray work, and people are saying, well, are the messenger RNA profiles have anything relevant to do to the protein levels inside the cell? So there's been a lot of studies out there comparing messenger RNA to protein, le- uh, protein levels, but they've always had a uh, very serious uh, limitation, uh, mostly because of technical challenges in large-scale protein identification and quantification. Uh, it's fairly easy to do a microarray, but when you deal with protein quantification in a large scale, you're dealing with proteomics, and because proteins are so much more complex than messenger RNA, it's a lot more difficult. 
And most of the time, protein levels were measured in one experiment compared to messenger RNA in a different experiment, sometimes even in a different time, in a different lab. And also, it's very difficult when you do, for example, a microarray experiment. You're, and that's something I say all the time when I give array, uh, classes on microarrays. You are not measuring gene expression. You're measuring messenger RNA levels, which are the combined effect of mRNA transcription and mRNA degradation. So the analysis of all of this was always a little bit difficult. Uh, some of the best studies out there actually use artificial fusion proteins. They got some interesting correlations. But even then, you're not talking about the real proteins because now they're tagged with something very stable, usually some, kind of, some form of GFP. So that can affect protein stability. Um, the gold standard for measuring um, intracellular protein or, or, or mole bio, intracellular molecule dynamics in a cell has always been pulse labeling. So in a pulse labeling experiment, what you're doing is you have your cells growing in a media that doesn't have anything labeled. In the, in the old days, it was radioactivity. You would suddenly throw in uh, C14. The old? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, in the old days, it would be uh, uh, radioactivity uh, carbon-14 or P32 or S35. Yeah. You would go from a non-radioactive media to a radioactive media. So now all of the new molecule being synthesized would incorporate that radioactive marker. Then you would take the cells and put them into a non-labeled media. So now you have a pulse of proteins or biomolecules that have been labeled during a certain length of time. And then over time, they're going to essentially, you see the production of these, of these labeled molecules. And then once you transfer into a non-labeled media, you're going to see their degradation. And you're able like to make calculations. Rate, Sorry? On, on, um, Dave Thomas on, on his episode of Futures in Biotech, he, he described it as a duck race. You take a bunch of little duckies and you pop them into a river and you follow them going through the river. Yeah, you can tell it somebody's was... living in the West Island. Um, <laughs> so in, in proteins, the way you do this now is you don't use radioactivity. What you can use is you can use um, slight variants of certain amino acids that have different number of neutrons into their atoms. So there's a slightly different molecular weight that can be detected by mass spectrometry. By mass spectrometry. So the method's name is called Stable Isotope Labeling by Amino Acids in Cell Culture, or SILAC. Uh, alternatively, you can also label uh, messenger RNA by a nucleoside analog called 4-TO-uridine, 4-STU, that can be independently purified from non-4-STU labeled RNA. So what this group did is they took a mouse cell line, NIH3T3, which is a very well-characterized fibroblastic cell line, and they simultaneously labeled it by SILAC or by 4-STU. Quantified the proteins by mass spectrometry, or for the RNA, they've purified three populations of RNA uh, using separation of ribosome-bound or not ribosome-bound RNA. So they had pre-existing RNA, new, newly synthesized RNA, as well as total RNA without separation. Then they used Solexa sequencing to see which RNA is in which population. So now they're able to really measure uh, protein levels, changes in, in labeled proteins and change in labeled RNA over time in the same cell line. So... It, and they brought out a lot of very interesting numbers, which I have to admit, I had no idea what these numbers would be. Uh, for example, um, they, they found out that on average, proteins are five times more stable than messenger RNA, and they span a much bigger dynamic range in abundance. That part, we already knew that. Um, one thing that was notable is they saw no correlation whatsoever between protein and messenger RNA half-lives. So the degradation of proteins, degradation of RNA, they're usually not linked. They're to totally independent mechanisms. Uh, levels of proteins span approximately five orders of magnitude. That, like I said, it's very large. That's actually a big problem in uh, proteomics. Uh, the, the wide diversity and protein abundance. But when they compared in a log-log graph the abundance of each proteins being synthesized to the abundance of their messenger RNA, they actually had a pretty good uh, correlation. The, the, the R2 square uh, score was 0.41. So at least you can tell that um, about 40% of protein abundance is controlled by how much messenger RNA for that protein is present. 
Uh, they tested that reproducibility by doing the same experiment in another cell line, a human cell line. So they're pretty confident about their number. And they also use that, the, the information they have to build a computer model to calculate average synthesis rate of messenger RNA and proteins for thousands of different genes. So this is where it gets really, really cool. So for example, so here's a little survey. So uh, Julian, you're back online? Justin? Well, okay. Justin? He was online, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if he managed he to get back it. on. So well, it's going to be a survey of one. Uh, okay. <laughs> it, may be a chat, it may be the chat room. What do you think is the median rate of transcription per hour on average in a, humans, in a mammalian cell? Number of genes that are tra how many, trained from DNA to protein. For each gene, protein. how many messenger RNA is being transcribed per gene per hour on average? How many well, proteins it's, it's are median, made, basically? Yeah. No, not proteins. We're right now just doing the messenger RNA. Oh, transcribed? Oh, no, not translated. Sorry. My, my, no, my just, yeah, just all. transcribed. How many messenger okay. RNA do you think we make per gene? In an, per gene or per cell? Yes, per gene. In, a, in one gene in a cell. Uh, it depends on the gene if it has a strong yes. uh, promoter. So what's, but what's the medium, num what's the medium oh, number? Oh, the medium number. Think? Of course, three. <laughs> you said three? Well, that's not bad. The, the actual no, number three. Is I'm kidding. Two. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't know. Maybe it's, five, six hundred. No, two. I was right with the three? Yes. <laughs> I, was, I saw that number and I went like, wow, that I didn't is read the paper. really, really small. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so a gene. There's a gene will be on average two? transcribed twice per hour. In a, is in that a because we have a lot of cells. genes and that biases the statistics or is it? Well, I have the distribution a in times. figure three in the paper. And uh, very, very few genes are as much as 10 messenger RNA per hour, and almost none of them have 100 messenger RNA per hour. So I was quite – I, I, I thought that number would be higher, to be quite frank. I was just but, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was answering no. my, my, my five-year-old's Okay. Answer. So now we have right. uh, each messenger RNA that is translated. So how many translation events do you think occurs per hour per messenger RNA? Okay, Medium so to number. describe that to the audience here, oh, my dad so, might be listening. So essentially you have, you have a messenger RNA molecule. You're going to have RNA. ribosomes bound on it. They're going to translate this into a protein. Copy it into a protein, right. How many times so, does that zipper action happen? Because it's like a zipper. As long as yeah. zipper attaches amino acids, you get a protein made. How uh, many times per hour? Median. Two. I don't know. No. <laughs> uh, 40. Maybe, well, maybe more. You want to use it more. To, how much? Did you say 30? They said about 40 proteins per messenger RNA per hour. But in this case, the, um, the distribution is much, much broader. You can get as much um, based on the distribution. You can get some of the highest one is 10 to the 4 proteins per messenger RNA per hour. That's the high range. But the median is 40 proteins per messenger RNA per hour. Uh, some proteins involved in translational regulation, um, EI, EIF4 uh, fragile X syndrome related protein, FRX2, tuberin, they have extremely low rate constant. They're actually translationally repressed, but they really see uh, different translation efficiencies in different, uh, in different genes. So it's quite fascinating. So based on all these numbers, as I said, about 40% of the variance in protein levels is explained by messenger RNA levels. And that's a lot more than what uh, people thought. So for people like me who do a lot of array data, array experiment, that's a good thing. Because essentially we can say, yeah, well, we're seeing expression profile, transcript, uh, transcript profiles for a lot of genes. And that is 40% correlated to the ultimate proteins level in the end. And they, they saw that in two cell lines. That's amazing. One sec, yeah. before you go on, uh, uh, Burke, uh, Justin is back online. His computer is charged, is charging. So if you could please pull him back. All okay. right. Yeah. Um, so that so now you you have you actually have a sense, right? Of you can actually visualize in your mind the the general trends of RNA being made into protein and how much RNA is being made off the DNA. Yes. Off the gene. And the other thing that they did was they tried to contribute. What is the contribution of uh, degradation to protein levels, whether it's messenger RNA degradation or protein degradations. And surprisingly, it's a very small contribution. Uh, degradation rates they found were generally very constant, at least in their one cellular model. Uh, but there were proteins that are known to have variations in degradation rates. But what they did after that is they divided all of their proteins into four categories. 
So you had unstable mRNAs but stable proteins, stable mRNA, stable protein, unstable mRNA, unstable protein, and stable mRNA, unstable protein. And they look for functional differences between the, four to, the proteins in these four categories. And they found very different types of proteins in these four categories. So for example, genes with stable messenger RNA and stable proteins, they're greatly enriched in, they call them constitutive cellular processes like translation, respiration, and central metabolism, like glycolysis, uh, ribosomal protein, uh, TCA cycle proteins. I wouldn't call that constitutive genes because, I mean, part of my work is to figure out how these genes are modulated under different growth conditions. So I won't call them constitutive, but they do represent a huge number, a huge proportion of the, um, of the energy that's being used in protein synthesis. Okay, so basically stable RNA, stable protein is basically housekeeping biological processes that are universal to all cells, probably. Exactly. Now you're going to have the unstable mRNA, but... Um, stable protein. Stable protein, you have, um, wait a second. Okay, this is unstable mRNA, unstable proteins. You have a lot of transcription factor, signaling gene, chromatin modifying enzymes, and cell specific, cell cycle specific proteins. So these are essentially sig the signal transduction molecules whose level needs to change very quickly. Uh, to they always say kill the those. messenger, right? <laughs> so when they say kill or, the messenger, it could be. Um, killing the messenger RNA and killing the, the proteins that are messenger information carriers. Exactly. Okay. So you, are, you now have a group of genes with stable proteins, but unstable mRNA. Uh, that's mostly related to actually RNA processing, strangely enough. Okay. And right. finally, you have stable mRNA and unstable proteins. That's extracellular and secreted proteins. So it's known a lot of secreted proteins have short cellular half-life. Sure. Uh, and there's a lot of proteins involved in cellular homeostasis, defense response, and proteolysis. But what's really cool about this paper, it's not just knowing uh, what contributes to the final protein levels into a cell, is now they have a huge data set of information on protein abundance and half-life. So a lot of people who do mathematical models of processes in cells uh, they need to know that information. They need to know how much of my enzyme is present in the average cell, uh, how fast is it being produced, and how fast is it de being degraded. And very often, these are parameters that are, have to be determined experimentally. If you have four or five proteins, that's okay. If you're trying to model a multi-protein system, it's very difficult. But at least now you have numbers that starting numbers, starting parameter numbers to know, okay, this is, this, I have the, the enzymatic information on my enzyme, and I know I have that, about this number of enzymes per cell, at least in this cell line for the enzyme I'm trying to model. This is going to be tremendously useful for systems biologists. You know, kidding, especially if, you know, if you're Craig Venner and you want to build an artificial creature, and you're looking at the complexity of 24,000 uh, open reading frames and uh, a billion post translational Well, they, they didn't get all 24,000. They got data on about 5,000, 6,000 proteins. It's amazing. Uh, so it's a good start, but it's not perfect yet. But it's, it's going to be a tremendously useful data set. And the funny thing is, you, I would have expected this to be known, right? And then <laughs> this kind of paper that says, wait a minute, guys, you know, you don't know anything. He, That's you why know, you got into nature. You essentially, it's something <laughs> that interests a lot of people. And people are saying like, oh, why didn't I think of that? I could have had a nature paper. <laughs> because the well, technologies was, yeah. that they were using were not, I mean, they weren't the ones, I don't think they were the ones that invented uh, CELAC labeling and the RNA labeling. They just decided to apply it to something very basic, but very, very important. And as long as their statistics are well done, they're done. This is Conan, by the way. <laughs> oh, hey, Conan. So the, um, you look at a protein like cystic fibrosis, right, the CFTR channel. S I think, sorry, 75% of the CFTR channel is degraded in the human cell, in the epithelial cells, those lining of your lungs and lining of your no nasal passage and gut. So the chloride channel is a very, very unstable protein. The, um, uh, the mutated form, the delta 508 phenylalanine, Five, residue 508 mutation, it actually 99% of it's degraded. 
Right. So understanding the stability of a protein in a cell and, and possibly how it's translated uh, can give you a really, really good indication of the molecular uh, mechanism of a disease. And now if you're going with a whole entire uh, genome, if you can, I mean, this is the first phase of this project, I think it, it'll give us some insight into uh, some of the mechanisms of disease or a better understanding of the biology, which I already thought we, I thought we already knew. But clearly, uh, this study was... It's fantastic at pointing out the, our ignorance, right? <laughs> Which is amazing. That's cool. Very yeah. good choice, Andre. Um, is Justin back? I'm hey. back. I'm this here. This is a summer back show. Back in black, as they say. Show. Hey, cool. And you are you in the same room? There's no brain no. posters in the back. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a different room now. I had to find some power. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, I like the idea of, of having uh, some brain images in the back. Hey, so yeah. I'm going to thank you Thank you both for coming on. Uh, these are some uh, really fun scientific stories. Uh, in, in part, one thing I really appreciated about this episode was it was, um, it was an episode for us, right? And uh, I hope um, that people can appreciate some of the stories that we picked. Um, you know, sometimes you've got to, you know, see what's interesting to you and then uh, see if that, that can uh, stick on uh, the wall of the greater uh, audience. Um, so this is a really good time to do it. I think we should, there's some follow-ups here, Andre and Justin. I think we can um, possibly contact uh, um, the group that did the, uh, the, the global uh, expression, mammalian gene expression control paper, and we could um, seek them out and potentially do a show on this and, and get their views on, on how and what and get, get them to give examples and, and describe some of the experiments that they did. Also, um, for the uh, bridging optogenetics with brain machine interfaces, um, that would be a really great line of uh, shows. Um, we've just finished a long series of shows on aging, interviewing folks from the Buck Institute. And I think the next step is to get into uh, brain machine interfaces with optogenetics. I think that would be a yeah. really, really fun interface there to, to, yeah, to go. Yeah, optogenetics uh, sounds fun. And I have, have a few people that uh, maybe we can give a call. <laughs> very cool. All right. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank uh, our, our guests, our, our panelists, Andre Nantel, Senior Research Officer at the Biotechnology Research Institute, Microarray Lab, National Research Council of Canada. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at McGill University in the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology. Thank you, Andre, for coming on. Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure. And um, we also have uh, the director of the Neuro Neuroprosthetics Research Group, associate professor, Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Miami. We have Dr. Justin Sanchez. Mark, thanks so much for, for having me on. And uh, just for all the uh, viewers out there, you know, it's, it's about having fun with science. So go out and do something great with it. And, uh, you know, there are lots of horizons that can be found. Let's Tell them, yeah, go out and save a million lives and yeah. uh, help those million that are, uh, you know, um, uh, disabled and give them a new life. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff you can do and you can actually make, it, make a difference. You know, not just one at a time, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions at a time. Um, I'd also like to thank Burke McQuinn for handling the audio and video boards and recordings today. Uh, it was a, a true challenge and he's been uh, a gen gentleman about it. I'd also like to thank the team uh, uh, that make this possible. Lisa Laporte, Lisa Kenzel, Frederick Louis, Eileen Rivera, Tony Wang, Mike Taylor, John Slanina, Jeff Stewart, Jason Howell, and the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. I've got to find out everybody works there. I've got to go visit uh, the cottage. Or, well, Wait until they have studio. the new one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Phil Peltzino and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. If anybody has any comments or suggestions, you can reach uh, me at Mark, M-A-R-C, at twit.tv or on Twitter at M-A-R-C, P-E-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. It's uh, at Mark Pelletier. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltzino.